Hey guys, uh, my name is David Roberts, and I apologize for not being in class today. I'm actually in Greensboro. I'm moderating for a couple of professors of horticulture um, during the Green and Growing Conference, which they have here every year. Uh, but Dr. Ding was kind enough to let me submit this video file of my interpretation of the Royal Society of London's uh, Philosophical Transactions by Atkinson. Um, so I'm just going to jump into it. Uh, you guys know this was essentially Atkinson's way of documenting and kind of explaining the evolution of the scientific research paper. Um, a 300-year study covering you know, a lot of material, um, which he used a couple of different techniques to um, analyze, a couple of different methods, the uh, rhetorical analysis and then the uh, multi-dimensional analysis, um, both of which we'll get into later. But um, using these methods, Atkinson found a few uh, significant things, and that was that early writings, the earliest um, between the 17th and 18th, 18th century, uh, were very uh, author-oriented and author-centered, uh, very egocentric. Um, the method of communicating at the time, um, the communicative norms, as Atkinson put it, um, were what predominantly influenced the method of documentation and reporting of the scientific articles, often in the forms of letters um, between a couple of correspondents. Uh, and these communicative norms that were established at the time were very heavily influenced by genteel conduct. Um, which is kind of evident in the earliest writings. Um, Atkinson talks about how significant changes occur as time goes by. Uh, like during the 19th century, um, greater emphasis, emphasis is placed on methodology and the different um, scientific techniques that are used at the time and making sure that those techniques are as precise as possible. Um, by the 20th century, Theoretical descriptions had essentially replaced experiments and methods as the rhetorical centerpiece uh, for these research articles. Atkinson's studies, I think, um, make it pretty obvious how the research article has essentially shifted from a, a very um, ethos-oriented um, manner of writing in which, you know, the author is the, the main means of persuasion, you know, it's up to the author's uh, ability to communicate, persuade, and be recognized, essentially, as a legitimate individual in his field. Um, and eventually progresses into what is a much more logos-oriented uh, manner of writing, in which the logic is the main means of you know, communicating and uh, convincing the audience of your uh, validity uh, and significance in your field. Um, so, uh, Atkinson kind of breaks his, uh, or at least the section that we wrote, um, read <laughs> into four main sections. The first of which was kind of just a, a, a study of other um, people which have studied the philosophical transactions in the past. Um, the second section was a methods and database area um, in which he kind of talks about the you know, methodology he uses to analyze these different things, and he describes the databases which he drew from in order to do so. Um, the third section, results of the rhetorical analysis, is uh, where he talks about, um, you know, his interpretation of how the science of writing about sciences has evolved. And then the fourth section, which Thomas is going to cover, was the multidimensional approach. Um, kind of a statistical analysis of these works, which he uh, randomly sampled. Um, so just starting off with the uh, past linguistic rhetorical research on the philosophical transactions, um, Atkinson talks about, I think, four you know, authors which have done previous studies. Um, the two main ones, I think, were uh, Deere and Bazerman. Uh, Deere, who studied the first seven years of the philosophical transaction, um, found two main approaches uh, within them. He found there was a, a scholastic approach in which arguing for or against a previously established premise via um, what Atkinson called deductive philosophical methods. 
um, is very common. Um, citation is a crucial element um, amongst this approach um, in that referencing um, well-established individuals is very important for the credibility of the author. Um, the second <clears throat> main approach was that of experimental philosophers, um, of which Robert Boyle was a, a very um, popular person. Um, this was kind of a rhetoric of immediate experience in which um, the persuasive power uh, depended wholly on the success with which uh, the author could recreate um, an occurrence which happened, you know, it kind of boils down to how well can he tell the story or um, convince his audience that it actually happened. Um, then he goes on to talk about Bateman, who studied the philosophical transactions reports from around 1665 to 1800. And um, he finds that uh, these reports really kind of evolve from uh, simple narratives of you know very short individual experiments that are kind of grouped together to much more elaborate descriptions of individual experiments which kind of um, are much more similar to what we're used to today uh, for modern research papers um, so over 135 experimental methods and results are reported within greater detail of a uh, Bezerman study and um, one of the inter interesting things I think which he shows is that by 1800 Articles had a rough three-part sequence, which um, was much closer to what we're used to today, as far as um, research papers go, or at least it was much more similar to what we're used to um, versus the, um, the older papers. Uh, that three-part sequence was kind of like a theory statement, followed by a hypothesis, followed by an experimental trial. Um, so you can see that even you know as far back as the 1800s, um, they were slowly beginning to kind of refine the science of writing these papers. Um, so Atkinson goes on uh, to the second section, his methods and database. Um, and he talks about how ideally um, good sociolinguistic studies will utilize multiple methods uh, for examining these texts. And um, he talks about that being a good idea because essentially any individual method for researching something will have within it um, some sort of a fault or um, you know, built-in uh, mechanism for um, error. And that by employing multiple techniques, you kind of eliminate your chances of that error um, occurring. You essentially just make a more efficient means of reporting your studies. And so Atkinson uses two techniques in order to prove his study as being valid, the first of which um, is a rhetorical analysis, um, which I'll go over in detail. And the second was the sociolinguistic register analysis, which um, Thomas is going to talk about in detail later on. Um, the rhetorical analysis was based on an explicit set of empirical determined uh, discourse functions for all of the text studies. Um, that was approximately 202 research articles from the Philosophical Transactions, and they were collected at um, seven 50-year intervals, and so starting in 1675 and leading up until 1975, um, Atkinson, you know, kind of poured over all these different texts and um, did his rhetorical analysis based on those. And then the sociolinguistic register analysis, um, which, you know, specifically he used a multidimensional approach, um, it relies on computational and uh, other statistical um, factors which uh, kind of analyze large corpora of texts. Um, it's used to supplement the rhetorical analysis, he says. Um, and so he takes 70 articles from the original 202, 10-per uh, sample group, and um, he uses these and converts them into like a, a word file which a computer can read essentially and uh, he enters a set of parameters which the computer will then you know create a numerical value either a positive or negative numerical value based on you know the criteria he enters um, for analyzing the text for certain words or phrases um, again Thomas will kind of get more into that but uh, for the results of the rhetorical analysis, 
Um, Atkinson breaks it down into um, four main categories, which are kind of um, present in all the texts that he studied, four main um, factors which uh, constantly occur. And um, those were the place of the author, which is how the author is represented within the texts that they're writing themselves. Um, the second is the preferred genre that the author writes in, or the discourse structure in which um, the research is actually reported uh, by the author. Um, the third was um, discourse communities in which um, the nature in which the texts are situated um, is what's really fully discussed. And uh, then, well, the fourth method is actually the MD analysis, um, which is not part of the rhetorical study. But um, starting with the place of the author, um, between the 17th and 18th centuries, um, it was a, there was a very heavy emphasis on you know the author himself, and um, it was like I said very egocentric, and um, there were several techniques which kind of you know illustrate how this is. Um, there were exceptions, like Atkinson talks about several people who presented more object focus studies, um, but for the most part, they were uh, very author-oriented. Um, and some means in which the author um, talked about his or herself, um, one example was witnessing, um, in which the author names off you know, certain important individuals who were either present during the experiment or whose work they referenced, or simply a name they might want to drop to kind of um, lend credence to their studies to establish themselves, the author, as a, a credible individual. Um, and then there were indexes of modesty, which um, the author actually shows caution in interpreting certain phenomena. Um, and this, you know, is done in a number of ways, which, you know, Atkinson talks about, but uh, it's mostly um, like a failure to commit to a certain belief or a, a certain theory they might posit. Um, you know, they call it modesty, but it's actually, I think, uh, a means of kind of safeguarding yourself from being labeled as incorrect. Um, there was a tendency toward miscellany in which frequent digressions occurred um, and a lot of unconnected observations. And so he talks about in several instances how the earliest papers were you know, short collections of smaller experiments. Um, and so within even these, Atkinson talks about how there are digressions and how the authors kind of wander off topic and um, make unconnected observations. So that was a common thread between the 17th and 18th century. And then one that I thought was pretty interesting was elaborate politeness, which is not really uh, the norm amongst research paper authors these days. Um, you know, at the time, you know, the earliest papers, um, Atkinson talks about how a lot of the authors would praise the Royal Society of London, um, or, you know, compliment one's peers' uh, work in a certain field, or a certain scientist's, you know, contribution to whatever research the current author might be studying. So I just thought that was interesting, um, kind of a way of flattering whoever it is you are trying to present this information to. Um, again, that kind of goes back to the whole genteel conduct of the time and the, the norms of communication. Nowadays, people in general, I guess, are far less cordial in how they, you know, talk to people and present themselves. But at the time, I suppose that was more or less the norm. Um, by 1875, Atkinson talks about how uh, the author-centered approach is much less common. Um, it's more used as a third-person self-reference, kind of as an introduction to one's works. Um, and the object of one's works is becoming the main focus for one's research um, discussion. And then uh, between 1925 and 75, um, the ob articles are becoming much more object-oriented, um, much less personal. Um, there are very, very few direct references to the author. In fact, nowadays, it's very uncommon, I believe, to directly reference oneself. Although, this article by Atkinson, he actually does uh, reference himself in the first person in at least one instance, which I picked up on. Um, but um, for the most part, 
direct references to oneself are intentionally avoided. Um, so instead of an author saying, you know, I found this or I found that, they'll simply say that it was shown or, you know, the discovery was made that, or, you know, state what it is they're saying without actually including themselves within that statement. So uh, that is, again, kind of a showing the shift from a, an ethos, um, ego-centered means of describing or conducting this research and information to a much more logical one that we're using nowadays. Um, Atkinson goes on to talk about the preferred genres and uh, discourse structures, essentially the two main genres in which these um, research reports were reported at the time, and that came in two forms, in the form of letters and experimental reports. And um, again, starting off early on, it was much more common for um, the early research reports to be um, more dialogue, more like a conversation between two people um, discussing a certain topic. And again, in a very polite and respectable manner, um, these authors would often exchange, you know, ideas, information, theories um, regarding a, a common topic. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, after that, you know, that early period, the 1665 to 1875 period, um, what's known as a Newtonian research becomes a very uh, influencing factor in research writing. And uh, Isaac Newton's research agenda essentially um, made the focus more science-oriented and less individually uh, focused. Um, so the letter format slowly became more of an introduction to articles or um, you know, just much less frequently used. And then uh, Atkinson talks about how by 1875 it was practically non-existent. So uh, again, just showing that evolution of the science paper. Um, and then there were the experimental reports, which were, again, uh, kind of influenced by the Newtonian um, objective at the time. Uh, early on, like the early 1600s, they accounted for only around 16% of all the papers that were submitted. Uh, and by 1725, um, a much greater emphasis was placed on the, the quantitative analysis and the descriptive methodologies that were used within the papers. Um, so they're already, you know, becoming less personal, more scientific. Um, by 1825, uh, experimental controls began to take place, graphs, scales, tables, uh, charts, different means of visually uh, representing one's data and studies um, so they can be easily digested uh, by a, a wider audience um, became common, um, you know, kind of showing how as the science progresses, so too do the means of communicating that science. Um, so that's kind of cool, I think. It's like a means of uh, both language and um, the sciences, you know, working in a very symbiotic manner. So I think that's nice. Um, Atkinson talks about how by 1925, um, the more traditional, or I guess what we're more used to um, today, the uh, introduction methods, results, and discussion format, which is common to today's research papers uh, became much more conventional. And then by 1975, it was more or less the norm. Um, and so that's, you know, around the time that the papers we know of today began to become more like they are. Um, Atkinson then goes on to talk about the discourse communities, which is essentially um, the nature in which these, set, these texts are situated. Um, and what he means by that is like in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries, um, the PT articles were, again, very dialogic and often responses to other reports. Um, by 19, I'm sorry, by 1725, um, there was a very oppositional tone to these um, dialogues. It was often like a, a scientist refuting another's claims or conducting a study which might contradict another uh, scientist's studies. Um, and then it's interesting, by 1775, it returned to like a more cooperative tone in which you know, there was a collaboration between different fields and uh, scientists within their own fields. So that's much more common also um, today, although there are certainly exceptions. Um, and then um, 1825, the next period that was studied, we saw an increase in the concern for the scientific method. Um, you know, 
the authors become much less self-absorbed. Um, the earlier texts, they were, um, you know, obviously kind of the center of attention, and uh, their research was just kind of, I guess, to explain how great they were. Um, and then, you know, as time goes by, it becomes the work itself which is more important, and um, that is, you know, clear as the, the author himself becomes less and less evident in those texts. Um, and so Atkinson talks about how around 1875 there is a development of contextualized research and collaboration of scientific communities, again, which is, you know, common today, you know, amongst universities, um, laboratories. It's really, I guess, only the private industry in which their research is not openly divulged and um, communicated in a productive and, uh, you know, I think appropriate manner. Um, you know, articles at this time become much more exhaustive because the scientific method is so much more important now. Uh, they feel a need to kind of get the recording of this down also, you know, and make sure that the manner in which um, their reports are processed is as efficient as possible. Um, so it's, I think, interesting that, um, again, as science progresses and becomes more and more efficient um, in the manner in which it is conducted, the research articles which discuss this science in themselves also become more and more streamlined and they become more and more um, effective and they, you know, like the science themselves, become refined and, um, you know, they become bloated at one point because they're trying to put so much information into like their methodology. Uh, Atkinson talks about how there's, you know, like a hundred page report in which the methods section is like 50 pages long. Um, nowadays, I think he said uh, two pages at most is common for the methodology sec section of texts, even if they're like 50 pages long. So, um, you know, I think that over time, you know, the science and the manner in which it's reported kind of have to meet a compromise. You can only put so much information regarding an experiment in there and still hold the audience's attention. And so, you know, as time goes by, um, past the 1800s, um, you know, articles slowly become more streamlined. Um, Atkinson says there's uh, less attention to the close delineation of research procedures and methods. Um, and so at this time, there was this uh, continued development of rhetorical conventions uh, for embedding one's research in a web of relevance, kind of like a way of, um, you know, explaining how their work has been affected by past works and will contribute to future studies should someone want to build on their work. Um, and so that web of relevance, I think, is also much more common in today's papers. Um, kind of trying to look at the bigger picture of science and how your work has contributed to that. And so by 1975, you know, around the time that the papers began to take the form that we're more used to today, um, they show all types of different articles. Um, and I'm sorry, all sorts of different articles show a greater concern for um, theoretical rather than empirical matters. Um, then Atkinson is going to go on to talk about the um, sociolinguistic discourse analysis in which um, he uses the multidimensional approach. Um, and that's essentially a means in which he can ascribe numerical values to certain things which he's already talked about. Um, I think it's common in science papers um, for a person to, you know, try and use numbers to kind of prove that what they've done is solid science and um, you know statistical analyses are very common in science articles these days so um, I think this MD analysis was essentially Atkinson's way of um, you know using um, his work in a statistical environment and um, what he essentially does is assign a numerical value to a certain word or phrase that pops up, like a first-person perspective, um, you know, uh, is very common in the earlier papers. And so anytime a first-person reference will come up, um, a certain numerical value will be assigned to that text. And so by assigning a set of criteria that can be evaluated in this way, 
um, entire numerical values can be assigned to these texts, either a positive or a negative numerical value. Um, and uh, from there, it can all be plugged into different, you know, statistical crunching programs and then interpreted through graphs and diagrams and designs, which um, Thomas should be able to talk about right now. So uh, thanks, guys. Thanks, Dr. Ding, again, for letting me submit this. Uh, you guys have a good day.